everyone, and welcome to this Ruby live event. Uh, today we have office hours with myself, Chef Ken Rubin, and also here to introduce Chef Scott Samuel, our VP of Culinary here at Ruby. Uh, so we're going to be uh, taking these office hours together today. Uh, we're really looking forward to addressing your questions that you have. And uh, for, uh, for Scott's first run at these office hours, to give an opportunity to introduce him and uh, have him give a shot at the, uh, the office hours that we're going to work on today. So bring your questions. If you do have anything that you want to ask, um, if you're unfamiliar with our platform, the top right hand, right next to where you see me, there's a place to add a question. You can click on the black ad box once you type your question in. That gets moderated on the back end so we can have a quick look at it before we publish it. Uh, when you do see a question on the right hand side that you like, you can go ahead and click the heart on that question. That will simply uh, bump that up to the top so that um, Scott or I can answer it a little bit more quickly. Um, so uh, without further ado, I just wanted to give a, a quick introduction to Chef Scott and then he'll um, give more, uh, more background about himself. But uh, we're looking forward to having both of us today on uh, your questions during these office hours. Uh, so Chef Scott joined Ruby about seven months ago. He came to us from an uh, organization called Zapongo, which does uh, health and wellness. And before that, um, Scott had a long history of working at the CIA and working on some of the academic and educational programming with them. Uh, but Scott and I got to know each other through Zapongo and started talking about um, this whole idea of, of cooking and food as medicine and all the different things around uh, learning to cook and you know, we had a lot of uh, similarities in terms of how we saw things, and that's where we kind of started our, our initial conversation. So I want to go ahead and um, pass it over to Scott now just as a, a way to introduce him. And Scott, if you would, um, just give a quick introduction and a bio, and then we can start diving into some of these questions that we have here. Okay, excellent, Ken. Thanks. So I've been a chef since I was uh, young. Uh, as a kid, I wanted to learn to cook, working in the kitchen with my mom. Um, I kind of grew up in Seattle and uh, was in restaurants in Seattle and opened up my first uh, restaurant when I was 25, which was a, a small bistro. And it was uh, the beginning of the farm to table concept where I had farmers coming to the back door with a bunch of beets and could I use them on the menu? So I've always been cooking uh, with a kind of a background of a Italian and French technique and seasonal ingredients. I spent some time at the herb farm in Seattle where we had a two acre garden and we were doing uh, 11 course meals. Uh, four days a week based on what was in the season and change in the menu every two weeks. Uh, I did spend a good amount of time with the Culinary Institute of America in Napa Valley as a uh, executive chef of the strategic initiative group focused on health and wellness, uh, promoting this to the, the food industry at large, um, working with Harvard School of Public Health and Walter Willett. So on my end, we were creating menus uh, around food as medicine and around the menus of change principles, which are the focus of um, how to create menus uh, for the future, which is plant forward. Uh, then I spent some time with uh, Bongo, which is a digital health company uh, operationalizing the concept of food as medicine to corporate America. So I worked with clients like Google, spent some time with the, the Google food team, helping them create their menus for their global operations to make sure that those chefs are menuing a plant forward menu. So it's really been dear to, and near to my heart about uh, promoting this concept of eating well Eating Well Made Simple, and now here with Ruby, uh, spending the time with our corporate clients and introducing this concept and the online learning has been excellent. I did some wonderful things in Seattle um, from starting a, a garden for students. I was working at Seattle Culinary Academy and uh, the students didn't know where their food came from. What does broccoli look like? So we worked with some farmers in the Sky Valley to create a kind of a farm to table program where the students would plant, uh, weed and harvest and come back and cook the food. So that when they got out to the industry, they actually understood where does our food come from, how much work it takes to uh, produce it, so that they were a little bit more mindful about what they were using. So that's a quick intro introduction. It's uh, good to be here and look forward to answering your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go ahead and just before we get into some of the questions that our students have uh, already peppered in here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just start off with my own question for you, Scott. Um, and that is during the pandemic, what are you, what are you cooking? What are some of the things that are your go-tos uh, during this time when you're at home a little bit more? Well, I was just looking at my fridge last night and it's uh, full of leftovers. I'm making a lot of stews. I've been making a, a chickpea Herrera, which is a uh, Indian dish with a lot of spices and tomatoes, um, canned tomatoes, 
uh, canned garbanzos, um, either with chicken or not. I've been making a lot of soups. Um, I like to use uh, kale and Swiss chard and onions and red onions and garlic and um, and then beans. So I've been doing this combination of uh, vegetables and legumes in a broth. So it's really easy. Then, of course, I've been making sourdough. And it was funny that I caught on the, the sourdough um, bandwagon pretty late. I kept reading about, like, why is everyone making sourdough? And then I go to the store to find some flour, and there was no flour or yeast. So I, I made my own sourdough uh, starter. It took about a week. And then finally some flour came in, and now I'm making sourdough. So bread and toast and big salads. I'm getting a lot of vegetables like beets and uh, carrots, and I'm roasting them and then combining those with whatever fresh greens I can get. So in the beginning, I didn't go to the store for a few weeks. So I ran a lot of my fresh ingredients out into soups that I made and froze. So yeah, good question. My uh, fridge is full of uh, soups from uh, my split pea to my Spanish chorizo, Swiss chard garbanzo to my uh, Indian uh, chickpea Herrera um, and making bowls. I've been doing ramen bowls. So a quick uh, ramen with some sort of roasted vegetable or sauteed vegetable on top of it drizzled with a little bit of chili flakes. Wow, sounds great. Uh, I think that the sourdough thing was something that a lot of us you know, picked up on you know, in part maybe because there wasn't yeast, as you said, but for me, at least just kind of speaking personally about it, it just was nice to have a project and something um, that I had to feed and maintain and take care of. And just the whole, for me, the process of working with starter and making bread that way, it's just a little bit different, has a different feel. It kind of uses a different part of your brain. Um, so it's uh, it's yeah. it's definitely pretty fun. Um, in terms of the like the produce and things, um, how, where are you getting produce? I know you're on you're on Hawaii, and um, what how, how do you find things? What's the kind of the shopping scene like? You know, the shopping scene is I am doing uh, Whole Foods and Safeway, and Whole Foods here has a whole section of local ingredients. So uh, you know, I'm typically walking in and doing my gorilla shopping with the uh, all produce. I'll walk out with a big bag, a uh, uh, big basket of produce. So most of it is grown in the in the local area, but the carrots and the potatoes and the things like that, um, garlic are not from the islands, but I kind of focus on what can I get that's been grown locally. And it's it's been mostly greens, uh, mustard greens, um, the Swiss chard and the kales. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and just dive right into some of these questions here, Scott. I'll let you take the first few and then um, I'll kind of follow your lead and if there's anything that you want to pass on to me uh, by all means okay yeah first question from mary joe is it a uh, best to store all nuts and seeds in the freezer i would say yes in ziploc bags um, with the date on them that you put it in i've noticed that some of my nuts here in hawaii have been becoming rancid because i haven't had them in the freezer on a regular basis especially my almonds and the uh, walnuts so high temperatures will uh, turn them rancid and you can definitely taste that. I, I noticed it when I made some granola and threw in some of my almonds that I've had around for a few months and the granola tasted rancid to me because of that one nut. So it's best, I would say, to keep them in the freezer for longevity um, and then you know make your uh, mixes and your trail mixes and have them out uh, at room temperature just for uh, making sure that they're kept, kept fresh. Uh, next question is, uh, where should you store garlic? Well, it depends on uh, how fast you're using garlic. I typically will buy a couple um, heads at a time, and it's important to squeeze the garlic before you buy it. If you're buying garlic and it's kind of soft, you already know that it's uh, going bad. And also take a look for sprouts. If there's any sort of green sprout coming from it, you know that it's already sprouting. And if it is, it's starting to turn bitter. So I typically will store two heads of garlic in a bowl on the counter with my onions at room temperature, uh, but I need to use it quick enough because it's starting to go bad or start to sprout. So it's a, a lot about buying the garlic and making sure that it's firm, um, you know, full heads before you purchase it and then use it quick enough. I've never had garlic in the refrigerator. I've had a little kind of garlic uh, cup next to my stove for years and I keep it in there covered so it keeps the moisture out. It keeps the light out and uh, it starts to kind of dry out before sprouting. So in a cool, dark place on the counter, but not in the refrigerator. Uh, Ken, do you have a, a way you store garlic? Yeah, I think uh, I would definitely agree. I tend to keep my garlic, you know, on the counter, kind of close to my main cooking area because I'm constantly grabbing 
an onion or a shallot or, or garlic. Um, you know, I kind of have two spots where I keep things. So I have, you know, my go-to, the things I grab and I'm working on. I also have a, a basement. So I'm fortunate that I have a basement, which is about 15 or 20 degrees cooler than, you know, the, the, the top floor. So I find that my, um, my onions and garlic and potatoes just do better down there for being out, but not being in the, in, in like a refrigerated type of a setting. Um, I think certainly the, the big thing that you mentioned about selecting garlic in the first place is probably the, the strongest um, advice. It's the best guidance because, um, oftentimes when you're at the supermarket or you're shopping for, for produce, you know, things, if you're not checking could already be, um, you know, weeks old and kind of on their way down. So it's always best just to kind of check and give it, you know, that, that quick squeeze and make sure that it's not sprouting or it's not already soft. Um, next question. Is there a good source on do's and don'ts of substitutions, fresh garlic powder, granulated, how much to use? What about onions? Are there general equivalents between fresh and dried herbs, juice of one lemon, relime lemon juice? So yeah, there's nothing like a uh, fresh garlic. Um, a lot of times if I, uh, am going to substitute, I typically am not having garlic powder and onion powder in any sort of substitution. It's more as a, an addition. So if I'm using fresh onions and fresh garlic and cooking them down, I might add some granulated garlic and granulated onion to support the flavor. But I wouldn't personally say that I would substitute, um, in my opinion. In terms of uh, fresh herbs and dry herbs, in terms of general equivalents, I would say that it could be a three to one um, of one tablespoon of dried herbs equals about three tablespoons of fresh herbs, even a little bit more. Depends on the dried herb. Uh, it, it's probably even more than that. So if I was to use a, a quarter teaspoon of thyme in my soup, I might use uh, two teaspoons of fresh thyme uh, in place of it. But then again, I'm always trying to use fresh herbs instead of dried herbs. So if you cannot get the fresh onions and garlic and, and herbs, um, the rule would be go less because your granulated garlic and your dried herbs are so much more concentrated. So start with a little bit less in the beginning of your cooking process. That's another key. If I'm using uh, fresh herbs, I'm going to use them depending on if they're woody or leafy. Woody herbs, be it rosemary and thyme and uh, maybe some oregano, um, bay leaf. Use that at the beginning of the cooking so the flavors can go throughout the dish. And then use fresh herbs like basil and tarragon and parsley and cilantro at the end of the cooking to add that top fresh flavor. Um, dried spiced herbs, the dried spices, um, using always at the beginning so you can extract the flavor as you cook. So this uh, chickpea herrera that I made starts with red onions, a touch of cinnamon stick, a, one clove, a little bit of cardamom, and I cook that down and it extracts the flavor in the base of the dish. And at the very end of the dish, when I've finished seasoning it with a little bit of lemon juice and salt, I'll add some chopped cilantro. So. There is no real substitute for fresh herbs, but if you have to go with the dried herbs, use a little bit less. Great. Yeah, I'll just one one thing just to add in there, I totally agree, Scott, that the fresh herbs, uh, the fresh ingredients, whether it's garlic or onion or, um, you know, one of those herbs that you mentioned, 100% is the most ideal situation to, to be in. Um, you know, I do find some utility in those products, you know, in particular things like uh, you know, dried onion or dried garlic, um, to, to boost something, to enhance something. If I feel like I am, uh, creating something and I just want to have a little bit extra saturation of that flavor, those things can certainly add that, that extra kick, that extra boost. Um, they have a different flavor dynamic almost. They're not quite equivalent, uh, to the fresh product. So they kind of do something different in terms of the uh, aesthetic of the, of the actual dish. Um, but certainly I think, you know, we get so many questions about substitutions. And I remember getting a question a long time ago about, you know, are there any uh, dried herbs that you just won't use that you just typically don't go for? And I would say, you know, generally um, something like dried cilantro really doesn't even resemble <laughs> um, fresh, you know, fresh uh, coriander leaf. The cilantro loses so much of its its, its elegance, its, its flavor uh, in drying. Um, you know, whereas something like um, oregano, I think does fairly well in a dried format and 
obviously, you know, is different than fresh, but still stands up, let's say. Um, so it's always interesting just to kind of let your taste buds do some of that work in determining like, you know, what is the impact of adding that to that, to that dish? Yeah. I mean, some of my uh, dried herbs that I never use, um, are like dried rosemary, I, I see no point. It doesn't really ever have that woody rosemary flavor that you're looking for. Um, and I have some old, um, dried spices that I just look at the cupboard and I'm like, I'm not going to use it, but the oregano, the, um, chili flakes, uh, the bay leaf, um, a little bit of time. Sometimes time can taste dirty. So I tend to put as a minimal amount as I want, as I can of dried thyme, because if you put a little bit too much, sometimes I can taste that through the end dish. I made this big beet puree one day um, for the CIA, like a gallon of beet puree. And I had dried thyme in the base and it came out that I couldn't even taste the beets. All I could taste was this kind of dirty dried herb flavor. So be very careful with your dried, your dried spices at the base. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I'm going to jump into this next question. In the recipe for millet croquettes, one of the ingredients is white sweet potato. As I cannot get this product, what would you suggest as a substitute? I can get purple and orange sweet potato, but maybe they'd be too sweet. Um, so, yeah, good question there, Ricky. I would say, um, you know, on the whole, if you're talking about a white sweet potato, it's going to be a drier um, type of sweet potato, not quite as sweet, but still sweet. Um, you know, certainly a lot sweeter than your typical you know, Yukon acid or any of the more pungent um, type aromatics that you might put in there just to offset any sweetness. But I think it should be perfectly fine. I wouldn't be um, overly concerned with the variation in sweetness between those different types of sweet potatoes. Uh, but let us know, you know, um, cook it up and let us know how it goes. We'd love to get your, your feedback on that. Uh, Scott, I'll pass the next question to you. All right. How can I use what I've learned in this course to begin a meal prep business or even become a personal chef? Do you have any suggestions or other resources to help expand our knowledge in those areas? Well, the meal prep business to uh, and a personal chef, they could be uh, very similar, meal prep, prepping things ahead of time um, that you could deliver to someone's refrigerator and they could take it to the next step to cook their meals. Uh, a lot of times a personal chef or a private chef might be on site cooking everything from scratch. But I'd say that uh, everything in the course from the knife skills to the dry heat cooking to the, the moist heat cooking, cooking with vegetables are all going to give you the foundation and the concept of uh, how to build meal prep. So a lot of meal prep will you'll have to think about the, the time frame of when you're going to cook it. So fresh ingredients like the lettuces and the herbs should be done at the very last second. So if you're getting a kit for somebody at their home, you could make the stews and you can make the, the bases of it, everything done, but chop your herbs at the last second. So you'll learn about the different ingredients in this course and how to put things together in the sequence of cooking a, a great dish. So the concept of mise en place, what do you do first? So when you're cooking in the kitchen, the sauces and the, the soups and the, the, the rubs and the marinades and you know those types of things will all come first compared to the very last minute, we're gonna toss it with the vinaigrette, we're gonna add the fresh herbs. So you'll learn a lot about the meal prep throughout the course and will lend to the meal prep business and uh, personal chef. Uh, any suggestions or other resources to help expand our knowledge in those areas? Um, Ken, do you have any uh, ideas around this within Ruby? Yeah, I think that's a great question, number one. I think that the whole idea of using your Ruby experience to expand out and to have some small business and like small enterprise for yourself is really great. We have a lot of students who want to go down that path. Um, you know, in terms of resources, I would say there's lots of great organizations out there that I think are designed to help people who are trying to start a business. So if it's um, something that's, you know, culinary specific, like, um, you know, working with organizations like the IACP, or there's a personal chefs um, association, or even like the ACF has a personal or private chef uh, certification. Those would be, you know, professional organizations that might be able to provide some support. I think also looking to your, you know, towards your community and looking towards, you know, who are those clients going to be? Who are those people? What are their needs? Um, the more research you can do about kind of, you know, who are you going to serve and why is going to be really, 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 really uh, important for you. So you might even check with your local uh, small business, you know, group in town, or you might check with 
uh, you know, civic organizations and things just to have a sense of, um, you know, what it takes to have a small business where you are and kind of where you can do some marketing or outreach or how do you find, uh, you know, new, new clients. Um, of course the, the big elephant in, in the room is, is COVID and the pandemic and what things are going to look like in terms of those worlds. Right. So I think we're all kind of, uh, you know, tiptoeing a bit around, you know, what are those opportunities? What can people do to, um, kind of differentiate themselves in a certain market and provide a service that people are going to feel comfortable with? Uh, but really, really good question. Yeah. Just to expand on that a little bit, I think in this, this time, uh, I would take a look at other businesses and what they're doing and kind of do a research of uh, the area and your, your demographic of what the demand is and maybe step out and do something a little bit different. I mean, I like this concept of a meal prep business and people still want to cook at home, but they definitely don't want to really go out and do all the shopping as they might have wanted to done in, done in the past. So you could have a meal kit business similar to Blue Apron, but instead of having a kit sent to you, you could have a menu and you could be scaling that so that you're bringing kits to people's home and they have a recipe to take it to the next step. So you've done the shopping and the chopping and the combining and bringing everything together and provide a last minute recipe. So that's kind of a lot of personal chefs will do that and they'll have a menu for the week and people will order from that menu. Some, is, uh, some of the items are completely prepared like the soups. Some of the items are here's your piece of fish and your vegetables and your, your quick cook recipe. So I would take a look at the, the market and see what's being offered and maybe differentiate, differentiate yourself and uh, do something different. Awesome. You want to take that next question there, Scott, about uh, measurements? Sure. Do you have any tips for measuring ingredients? In some recipes, ingredients go by weight. Example, pasta and can't be measured using measuring spoons or cups. Would you use this kitchen scale or just eyeball to estimate amounts? Um, all are possible, but I do have a kitchen scale. And I, uh, you know, a lot of recipes are written, written in cups and teaspoons. And if it's a dry ingredient or a liquid ingredient, um, you'll see it as fluid ounces or a tablespoon or a teaspoon or a cup but if you do get into things that are like pasta or swiss chard or you know it's very hard to say uh, exactly what it is so getting a scale and a lot of times if it's more of a professional recipe you'll see it listed by weight or um, you know either as a ounces or grams um, and that's where you can get exact but I, I have a kitchen scale that i use anytime i'm kind of confused by a recipe that might say you know, in your case, one cup of pasta. Well, then I will go to my uh, computer and look up the yields for a pasta. One cup of pasta is 450 grams. Then I'll weigh the pasta if I want to be that exact. That is if you want to be exact following a recipe. For me, I'm looking at um, recipes as a guide to cooking. So then I will, I kind of eyeball it. If I ever ran into a baking recipe, which is more definitive in terms of weights and measures and uh, the, the proportions, um, I would be very surprised if it had something that wasn't uh, easily weighed out or measured out in either liquid measure or dry measure. So yeah, having a kitchen scale is great. Eyeballing is great when you're getting past the concept of following a recipe exactly to the point where you're kind of creating something based on the techniques you've learned. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that um, when you're learning to cook and you're becoming more intuitive, more comfortable, that you could grab a, you know, something you can have less of a measurement, but certainly for things like baking, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Scott, like having a scale, having the actual number of grams and things like that become really, really important. I know just to go back to the sourdough uh, piece from earlier that, you know, for people who are doing the sourdough experience, um, probably the number one thing that when I talk to people about it, you know, friends and family and so on, uh, the number one thing that I would recommend to them when they were getting into it was just spend the $15 or $20 and just get a scale. It's going to make your bread baking or any baking a lot easier. I also think it's an important tool just for people to develop some awareness of what things really weigh. A lot of people have no conception at all about weights and measures and kind of if they took a pinch of something or something in the, you know, in, in their hand, what, what that is. And I think it's just a really important skill um, as you become more comfortable cooking. So um, great, great um, question there. Really think it's important that people look at all the different ways they could have, um, you know, ways to measure, ways to kind of understand where their, how their food is being uh, constructed. 
Uh, next question here. I'm thinking about taking the plant-based course as well. Does it go over varying cook cooking techniques the way this course does? So, uh, Jamila, um, you know, I think it'd be probably, oh, Patrick just said she's in pro cook. So you're in pro cook. That's great. Plant-based covers some of the same techniques as pro cook. Um, but obviously has a plant-based perspective. So some things like handling a knife or heating a pan or basic techniques like steaming or sauteing, um, those are going to be very much comparable, but other techniques that you're, um, you know, potentially going to be faced with, uh, in terms of pro plants, much, much different content. So all new techniques around fermentation and raw gastronomy and, dehydration and some things that are really kind of plant-based uh, focus. So um, yeah, definitely recommend it. If you're interested in learning more, uh, if you want to contact us, uh, someone on our support team, be happy to explain more or kind of walk you through those, those differences. Um, and take one more here and then pass the rest down to Scott. Uh, Laura says, I'm writing a book about how my lifestyle change to a plant-based diet has eliminated my hypertension, lupus, and stabilized a brain tumor, a love story really of food. Where do I begin to look for a publisher? Um, wow, Laura. So great question. I would say the, the first thing you want to do is just have really good proof sources, good material that you can share. Um, oftentimes, you know, people who are authors, people who are writing, um, you know, instead of going directly to a publisher, may have a, a agent to work with. That person can help represent you and help, you know, you understand the landscape of publishing or just generally platforms that you can publish through. And if it's a conventional book publisher, that's great. If it's um, online, if there's other content elements that might be part of what you're working on. Um, but generally, I would just say, you know, just make sure you have really good proof sources and, um, you know, start, start sending it to, to places. Um, again, if you had an agent or someone who could support you on that, that's kind of part of their role is getting it out to, to lots and lots of people. Um, but certainly it's something that you can do, uh, on your own as well. Uh, Scott, I'm going to pass the next one down to you. Oh, 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 there's a comment here from Fran also. Um, Fran Costigan, who's the director of our vegan uh, pastry program. Fran chimes in here, really important to get in the habit of using a scale. So great, great um, thoughts there, Fran, um, especially in the baking and pastry world, 100%. I'm gonna now pass to Scott um, for this next question um, about focusing on cuisine styles. Sure, well, I have to echo uh, Fran here for a second on the, the sourdough story. I started learning to bake bread years ago. Then I got this book called Bread Alone, uh, probably about a decade ago, and started learning about the poolage and the pan and the different ways to do it. And everything was uh, by scale. So that's when I bought my home scale a while ago. And then I'm reading the, you know, I'm looking for the best sourdough recipe online so I can start. And uh, the first um, ingredients were listed by one and a half cups of flour, one cup of water. Like, oh man, am I going to have to go ahead and convert this myself? And then right below it was the grams. So I have my scale in my kitchen. I pull it up anytime I'm using it for baking and I'm going to definitely use it uh, for uh, my bread to make sure it's not, it's consistent now. So my bread is coming out pretty consistent because I am going 150 grams of starter and so forth and so forth, as opposed to a cup and a half of starter, which is never exact. So this next question is, uh, when starting out, should you focus all your energy on one type of cuisine, example, Japanese, or master it before moving on to another? I think it's a, a good question in terms of uh, well, starting out in general cooking, I would say uh, to get a feel for the different cuisines from Japanese and the Asian types of cuisines and the Mediterranean, be it French or Spanish or Italian, and those types of cuisines, and then Latin American and those types of cuisines. But I feel like uh, it's your what, what's your interest? Um, Japanese, focus on Japanese and get a feel for, I believe, the ingredients and then see how those ingredients kind of cross over into other cuisines so that when you're kind of uh, cooking in the kitchen, you're not always just stuck with, let's say, Japanese ingredients, but you've got an understanding on how to use that same ingredient and maybe that technique in another cuisine. So I feel uh, if you're looking for to master something, I'm not, I'm not a master at any cuisine, but I have interest in all of them. So when I felt like I didn't know enough about Thai cuisine, I jumped into Thai cuisine and 
jumped into the cookbook and started reading it. But for me as a chef and already knowing how to cook French and Italian and some Japanese and Latin American, um, I really was interested in how the ingredients were used and the different techniques involved and the different layering. So I'm learning more about the, the technique in a cuisine and how that might be similar to uh, another cuisine. So learning ingredients and techniques as your foundation and then how each of those apply to different cuisines uh, would give you a well-rounded um, education on food and culinary. So when you're starting out, if you're interested in one, dive into it, but always think about, you know, I'm looking to understand techniques and ingredients. And then in the long run, you'll be able to say, oh, I understand how that technique in Japanese cuisine, making a dashi, for example, applies to, you know, making a stock in French cuisine, similar things, liquids that are flavorful, but they're done completely differently. Ken, did you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think the only thing I'll, I'll add, I'll just, I'll kind of um, echo your, you know, your sentiments about the idea of, um, you know, learning lots of different cuisines, learning what's interesting to you, and also being okay with not mastering uh, a cuisine. That's something that I think even people who are cooking, uh, you know, a cuisine for 20, 30, 40 years, I think that a lot of them would contend that the more they do it, the more they realize that they have more to learn. Um, so the idea of mastering a cuisine is almost um, like mastering art. Like you, you, you can't do it. The more you do it, the more you realize that it's an in incredibly big universe to, 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 to play in and to kind of learn in. Um, but I like the idea that you could have a wide variety of cuisines that you can draw from in terms of ingredient usage of technique, um, the aesthetics behind it. Um, and a lot of it is really understanding that many cuisines have lots of commonalities, but it's the execution or the presentation of the aesthetic that makes it unique um, for sure. Uh, next question here, after completing a course, what information will we have access to? We will be able to go into my dashboard. Also, while enrolled in a course, how do I access lessons? Is there a separate fee? Uh, so Linda, um, when you complete a course, you'll have access to the, the recipes and the lessons contained in that course uh, via your dashboard, via the course itself um, in perpetuity for life. So that's one thing that you can have um, access to. Uh, in terms of you know the lessons themselves, Ruby has um, in its gallery, it has courses and it has lessons. Um, even though that some lessons are embedded in courses, there's also existing lessons that exist just within lesson galleries. So if your question is that you wanna see all those other lessons, not just the ones in your course, um, just reach out to us. There's a, a membership that we do that gives you access to uh, the entire lesson gallery as, as well as some other uh, shorter courses that you can get with that with that fee. But uh, Linda, if you wanna reach out to our customer service team, uh, they'd be happy to walk you through some of those options. Uh, next question, I am a food blogger specializing in home cooked Thai food recipes. I operate Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube accounts, which are all working a bit exposure wise, but wonder if you can give me some ideas on how to monetize my efforts. Uh, so it sounds like you're already doing a lot of great things, honestly, in terms of, um, you know, building a platform or a pathway for yourself to actually monetize the efforts. Um, I would say if there's anything else you can do uh, in terms of community, that might be some other options. Uh, but certainly if you're just working online, uh, it's having good presence in various channels. It's having an audience that you're building. It's having um, you know a, a vision or a voice or a mission that you can um, use to be distinct or unique in the marketplace. Um, and ultimately, it's about the you know the the storytelling and the uh, ability that you have to bring people in. Uh, captivate them, make them trust you, um, you know, kind of believe in the process that you're putting out there. So um, I would just say keep up, you know, doing the work that you're doing, uh, but, you know, continually find new ways to to build that audience. Uh, Scott, I want to pass the, the next one on to you. Okay, it's uh, about flour and the lack of flour. Uh, with no whole wheat flour available locally, I'd like to try using teff flour to make a basic bread in the bread machine. Could I simply add some vital wheat gluten to the flour? If so, what is the ratio of flour to gluten? Uh, good question. I know that uh, teff flour doesn't have a, 
um, the gluten that you need to make the bread. So I would think that you could add vital wheat gluten to a proportion, but I'm not sure what that proportion is. Um, I know that I would like about 13% of uh, protein in my flour. That's the bread flour typical, 12 to 13%. So I think we'd have to do some math and see if uh, vital um, wheat gluten is 100% and TEF is uh, 0%. Um, Ken, do you have any, uh, have you ever tried this combination of the two to have uh, any sense of a ratio? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a science question for sure. I think there is yeah. likely a solution, but it requires a calculator, right? So um, finding the amount of protein that you need from the gluten is going to help, you know, create the structure uh, possibly. But I'm just curious about the other physical characteristics of the TEF. If it's um, enough to have uh, the TEF by itself, or if some other gluten-free yeah. type flours might be added with it. Um, so when yeah, I think about a, that, I think about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a great cookbook, uh, Gluten-Free Cooking um, by a chef in the CIA that's you know, probably 10 or 15 years old. And there's all sorts of combinations of flour with your rice flour and your tapioca flour and a combination of making a gluten-free flour so I don't remember if there's a TEF in there, but there's definitely the, the gluten content of all the different um, flours out there in addition to how you're gonna combine that with something that has no gluten, like TEF flour. So, you know, in my mind, I might think if uh, vital wheat gluten is 100% and TEF is zero, you do the math and you're gonna have, you know, three quarters TEF and one quarter vital, or maybe even a little bit mm -hmm. less if you wanna get to that 13% bread flour. So it's about the math yeah. and the, uh, I would look into some other uh, flavors and other types of flours that might be gluten-free to add to that. Yeah, the equation might be also that it's not just the protein content, but also the nature of the starches, how they absorb liquid, uh, you right. know, what kind of structure those starches also provide in the context of the gluten providing that kind of matrix, that web. Um, but uh, yeah, I think certainly, um, if you want to start with TEF, that's a great a great place to start. But it might be that some starch or some sorghum flour or rice flour, or other things might play into that in part just for texture texture purposes. Um, I've been working with TEF flour just the last um, eight or nine days, trying to do some fermented batter for injera for Ethiopian uh, sourdough, basically sourdough flat flatbread. Um, so the idea is that, you know, fermenting it and then taking a part of that fermented TEF and water mixture and cooking it into a paste and thickening it. And that becomes kind of a batter, like a crepe batter almost. But um, the TEF itself, even when it's ground to a flour, has a much different way of absorbing liquid and kind of behaving compared to other sorts of flours. So that's why, in part, I mentioned you know, the possibility of incorporating other flour types uh, and not just relying on a starch and a, a protein, you know, with that gluten. Right. Um, next question here. Um, hello, in making uh, sauces that call for sweetener, what should be the ratio in respect to other ingredients? So it's just a matter of taste. An example is the lemon chicken with pine nuts and olives recipe in one of the lesson practices. So I would say anytime you're considering this kind of acid, sweet, acid, sugar balance, a lot of it's just going to be completely based on taste. So even if we were to give you ratios that said something like, hey, for every um, cup of this, use half a lemon or use a teaspoon of vinegar, um, even with that, within that sort of a formula or structure, you're still going to have a lot of variation. You know, what kind of vinegar is it? How acidic is it? Um, how sweet really was that base? If you're using citrus, like lemon or lime, and you say half a lemon, like that's going to be a different amount of you know, liquid, but also a different amount of acid, <laughs> depending on what that actual lemon is like. So I would say that let taste guide you. Um, the best thing to do when you're balancing is, um, you know, add some acid, um, give it a stir, and taste it. If it's not popping the way you want, then, you know, add some more. 
Um, but really in finding that balance, you're going to make your food a lot more interesting, a lot more delicious. Um, Scott, any thoughts there on the acid um, question, just in terms of um, balancing dishes and things? Yeah, I mean, I think that the the acid and the sweet and the salt are all kind of uh, things that could be built in to your cooking, but then it's a matter of preference at the end. So, you know, if you have some raisins in that, you're going to have sweetness from the raisins. I see there's honey in the recipe, and that's kind of balancing out the sour. Personally, I don't want my savory food to be too sweet, so I probably wouldn't put that whole tablespoon of honey. I would probably taste the final dish and maybe touch it with honey just to make sure that it had that balance. So yeah, as Ken said, it's all about a personal preference um, at the end. And if you're following a recipe that has sugar in it or something that's a, you might not really think that you want it to taste like that, keep it out and taste it without it and then add it as a little at a time to kind of bring it up to your preference if needed. Yep, great, great guidance there. Uh, you wanna take a stab at this next one, Scott? The uh, ranch and Caesar dressing question here. Sure. I'm looking for spices to make my ranch and Caesar dressing taste more creamy. I'm using silken tofu as the base. I've experimented with nutritional yeast, but I'm looking for a greater alternative to that. It will bring the buttermilk vibe. Any thoughts? And I assume that we're trying to uh, keep it dairy free because there's lots of thoughts that would revolve around dairy. I can't think of any sort of spices that are going to make it more creamy. Um, I would add some fresh herbs to it for flavor, but uh, you've kind of got me stump on the concept of uh, the buttermilk vibe. <laughs> any thought? Any thoughts, Ken, on the buttermilk vibe? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that what maybe what we're going for here is just how do you get that acid, that kind of tanginess that buttermilk might provide. Um, you know, the dressings that I think she's referring to here. Um, you know, have a creaminess, but they also have kind of a acidic backbone to them. Um, and yeah, in terms of flavors, I would say definitely adding fresh herbs is going to be a great way to go. When I think about, you know, the ranch flavor profile, I think about kind of the onion, the garlic, the chives, um, you know, kind of some of those flavors, as well as the acidity, that kind of tanginess that adds some brightness to that otherwise pretty, pretty creamy, you know, could even be leaning on sort of heavy type flavors. Uh, but I would say if you're going for creaminess and you're not getting texture, you know, maybe change up your base a little bit. So you could use um, a combination of soaked cashews and then maybe partial silken tofu. You might just overall thin it out a little bit so that you have a kind of a, a little bit of a lighter, smoother texture that might, you know, more evenly coat the leaves of your salad and things like that. But ultimately the tanginess, if you're going for that, it would just be a matter of acid. So something like, um, you know, apple cider vinegar or lemon juice um, would help create some of that acidity to help with that lift. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, helpful for you there. Uh, hello again, in relation to meal prep, how would you handle fresh pasta? Is it possible uh, packaging cut uh, pasta that the customer could just boil it in water for a few minutes. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's the way people buy fresh pasta at the store. They just have it, you know, wrapped in a package. And um, the idea is that it's refrigerated and partially dried, but fresh pasta. Um, so it's been made and probably hung for a few hours, let's just say, so it's not completely moist. Uh, but the idea there would be that uh, you could take that um, just drop it into boiling water and within, you know, two, three, four minutes have um, freshly cooked fresh pasta um, at, at your disposal. So it um, should be pretty, pretty straightforward in terms of that option for people, um, certainly. And that can even be frozen. So there's no reason why you couldn't make the fresh pasta and then uh, portion it and freeze it. And then, um, you know, just apply a, a quick thaw. It doesn't even have to be 100% thaw, but a, a quick initial slacking, we'll call it. Um, and then, uh, you know, cook it cook it from there. So uh, great, great thinking on that one. Scott, I'm going to pass the next one to you about uh, cooking steak. Yeah, a little bit about more about the pasta. You kind of said everything 
in terms of letting it dry a little bit. And uh, just, I've always noticed when I make fresh pasta and I, I let it sit any amount of time, if I don't have enough semolina flour coating the outside of it, it's gonna kind of stick in a, a lump. So I've bought a lot of fresh pasta just at the store and I always notice that it's been dried a little bit with enough semolina flour. So if you're gonna be doing this for meal prep, make sure it has a, a chance to dry and you're, you're coated with the uh, semolina. So next question is, uh, hello and thanks uh, in advance of the other question. Uh, when searing a steak, is it best to sear than cook, traditional or cook than sear, the reverse? Additionally, does it make any sense to sear one inch steak? Much love, BKJ. So I'm, I'm gonna go with the traditional. I have uh, never taken a steak and uh, cooked it uh, and then seared it. I, I like to uh, sear it for the caramelization of the flavor on the outside of the steak. Typically, I'm uh, letting my steak sit at room temperature for 15 minutes to a half an hour so that I can get the perfect cook on it. Um, then I'm seasoning it with salt and searing it on pretty good high heat or on a grill on high heat and then bringing it to a lower heat to finish cooking so that I don't overcook it so that I have a nice evenly cooked steak with a flavorful crust on the outside. The other method, the reverse method, if you were to cook it, if you were to bake it and then bring it out and sear it, I think that you're gonna be uh, having an overcooked steak because you've already cooked the steak and once you sear it and add that high heat, it's gonna to penetrate to the center of that steak. And does it make any sense to sear a one inch steak? Um, I would say yes, a one inch steak is a, I would sear it for a less amount of time on each side so that you're not overcooking the steak. So high heat pan, medium heat pan with a high heat cooking oil and uh, a sear, and when you do, let it sit there for one minute without touching it, then it should be able to come off the pan and sear the other side for one minute and then let it rest for five minutes. And then you should have a perfectly cooked uh, and flavorful one inch steak. All right. Awesome, great, Next thank question. you. Um, you wanna take it, Scott? Sure, I haven't read it yet. I'm about a 30% through the <laughs> vegan professional cooking course. If we are not provided with a recipe for a task, is it acceptable to find a recipe or are we expected to create our own recipe? Um, I would say that if you don't have a recipe at the end of the task, uh, finding a recipe that would be similar to what was taught throughout that task would be acceptable or creating your own recipe. Um, uh, Ken, do you know this? Uh, vegan professional course that won't have a recipe on a task that they're asking yeah, uh, a student to create um, a recipe? Yeah, I'm not familiar with this exact task. So Christopher, if you want to contact our customer service team, we might be able to provide more detailed response. But certainly if there is a task that has a suggestion for a recipe or an activity and we don't list a recipe, um, certainly if you wanted to find one on your own or create one that was still leveraging the competency or the technique or reinforcing the same learning outcome, that would be um, appropriate. But certainly if you want to reach out to us because of, um, you know, the particular personal nature of the question, uh, we'd be happy to walk you through what that what that might look like. Um, but really, really good question there. Yep. So next question. Hi, first time viewer. I'm in the UK and have a rabbit to cook. It's been butchered. So do you have any ideas of what I can do? Um, well, I've cooked rabbit um, a variety of ways, and if I was fabricating it or butchering it myself, I would break it down into the legs and the loins and, and do separate applications. Uh, specifically, the loin will be great for a quick sear, um, but if you've already got it butchered, I'm going to think of a rabbit stew and uh, taking that rabbit and doing a marinade on it with maybe a little bit of white wine and some fresh herbs and some lemon your salt and pepper, uh, so maybe a six hour overnight marinade, and then take it out of the marinade, pat it dry, and then do the sear grazing method. So you're gonna sear it for some flavor, then you're gonna add some mirepoix, and then you're gonna cover it with a liquid and make a stew. So that, if it's already been butchered, um, is my uh, recommendation. If you're able to get the back loin out on its own, it's the best meat that there is, and you can kind of fabricate out the back loins and use those as a, as a quick sear method, like a saute, and have that because they're so tender. But the legs um, need to be uh, braised for the best um, outcome. 
All right. Um, next question is, may I ask, what is your split pea soup? Vulnerable to suggestion. I think it's on next on my stove. <laughs> what is in my split pea soup? <laughs> you know, I start um, with bacon and onions and garlic, and I cook that down until I've got an intense caramelization and great flavor. Um, and then I uh, add my split peas, and I've made a vegetable stock or a chicken stock. Uh, and then I simmer. Uh, so it's a it's a good two to one on the, the stock because it, the peas absorb so much liquid. And at the end of this one that I made, I had some uh, ham, a big chunk of really nice roasted ham. So I diced that and sauteed the little tiny chunks of ham and then folded that into the finished soup. So I had the bacon base and then the really nice ham at the end. I also um, actually made a ham hock stock. I totally forgot about that. So I found some smoked ham hock in the frozen section. So I made a ham hock stock. So instead of a vegetable or a chicken stock, it was roasted ham hocks simmered with some maripois for about three or four hours and then used that and then took any meat on the ham hock and added that. So we had the bacon, the ham hock, and the ham with the ham hock uh, stock. So it sounds like the ultimate split pea soup. <laughs> yeah, I was going to just uh, add in, I've been doing um, a yellow split pea soup here at my house. Um, one of my uh, COVID pandemic food splurges was buying a, a pound of uh, dried porcini mushrooms. So I really like yellow split peas. I use it a lot for, um, you know, uh, Indian style and kind of Middle Eastern style um, soups and stews and things. But in this case with my porcinis, I took an opportunity to put a few ounces of dried porcini with shallots, um, and these these yellow split peas and made a really really delicious soup that i was able to garnish with just a ton of uh parsley and chives kind of a brighten you know brighten it up a little bit because those split peas and those mushrooms are pretty earthy pretty pretty base flavors but i love the texture of that of the split peas just amazing um really really uh hearty food obviously for sure so great great comments there um uh, next question is where do i find info on the vegan baking course and it looks like patrick already populated um the link so um if you want to have a look at that uh link or if you just google even essential vegan desserts um you'll find um that page and you'll find a course video i'll say that um the students in that course with fran costigan give just amazing glowing feedback, the reviews and the commentary, the feedback that we get from students about that course is just spectacular. So uh, I have a lot of confidence that if you are interested in that course and uh, you enroll, you're going to have a um, an amazing few months of dessert heaven uh, ahead of you. So uh, have fun with that and good luck. Um, that looks like all the questions that we have for today. Just wanted to, again, uh, thank Chef Scott for joining on his uh, inaugural chef office hours and uh, certainly you can look forward to seeing him uh in the future uh on uh, these these ruby live events so i'm going to pass it uh just back to scott real quick just to say a quick goodbye but until next time uh we'll see you in class and happy cooking excellent uh thanks for that ken um i will be doing another uh live event next week uh kind of creating recipes or uh, working without recipes so how to build your pantry for different cuisines around the world and then how to uh, cook without recipes based on some of the techniques that you might have learned throughout Ruby and building up your uh, repertoire of the technique and how to work out of your pantry. And then what you're really ending up is uh, buying your perishable ingredients um, at the last second. So that's next week. And uh, thanks, Ken and Patrick, for uh, my inaugural live event.